I think we start our big seminar. And I'm happy to introduce our speaker today, Sergei Alakumov from Copenhagen. And he will speak about some, uh, something about triangulations of um, projective spaces. So, um, thank you, Sergei, please. Okay. Thank you for inviting and introducing me. Uh, so, yeah, this is, as it says here, this is a joint work with uh, Karim and Raman. And uh, the topic is, uh, as I said, uh, triangulations of RPM and more specifically small triangulations. Okay. So, uh, yeah. So uh, let's denote by size of M, where M is a manifold, uh, the minimum uh, number of vertices we need to triangulate this manifold. So uh, I guess this quantity is interesting for itself for different manifolds, but we're now talking about families which depend on, let's say, dimension. So a trivial example will be a family of spheres, uh, Sn, so n dimensional sphere. And then we know that uh, you need n plus two vertices to triangulate it. And uh, yeah, it's easy to construct such triangulation. So for, uh, yeah, surprisingly for more complicated examples, actually for all other examples, the exact bound, uh, we don't have an exact bound. And moreover, the lower and the upper bound uh, usually far away. So for example, for the torus, uh, we have a quadratic lower bound and uh, there is a very nice exponential construction like here with two to the n plus one vertices. Uh, but yeah, as I said, these two bounds are very far away. So for the case uh, of the projective space, RPN, uh, the best uh, current bounds again, quadratic the lower bound and exponential the upper bound. And in this talk, I'm gonna present a construction of a triangulation of RPN. Uh, which is sub-exponential. So, uh, yeah. so yeah, let's talk about RPN. It's um, actually very easy to get something like that. Uh, so uh, to do this, you just, um, yeah, actually, I'm not gonna explain how to do that, but that's very easy. Uh, then uh, you can improve it a little bit uh, to get uh, to get rid of this three. Uh, then uh, the, there is also a very nice construction by Ventrell and Jenk, uh, which is uh, somewhat uh, recursive in the way that um, so what they prove is something like that. This is not the exact thing quality. Uh, but essentially they construct uh, RPN plus two using RPN plus one, RPN, and actually RPN minus one. So, uh, and yeah, and the number of vertices which we get here is essentially a Fibonacci number, uh, which is smaller than two to the n, uh, but unfortunately it is also exponential. So, yeah, uh, and the result which I'm going pre to present is this one. Uh, so we give a construction of RPN with uh, essentially this many vertices. So uh, here you have uh, in the exponent something like one half square root of n times log n, which is sublinear. So that's why we call this number sub-exponential. So, okay, log is uh, with the basis e. Uh, is it? Uh, yeah, I think so. Yeah. So it's n to the power square root of n. Oh uh, yeah, something like that. Exactly. Uh, so uh, there is also this. Uh, yeah, there is also this uh, small term to 
get rid of all the complications of polynomials and so on. But yeah, as you said, it's essentially n to the square root of n. It's square root of n to, to square root of n. Uh, no, it's... One half. Uh, yeah. Yes, 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 because in the construction. The yes, end. okay, it's square root of n to the square root of n, yes, because of the one half, you're correct. Okay. Um, so this is the result. And uh, let's start proving it. So I'm gonna, I'm hoping to give the complete proof this time. Uh, so first, uh, let us uh, somehow reformulate what we need to do. So if we have a triangulation of RPN, uh, we can consider its universal cover, uh, which would be a triangulation of SN. But not just any triangulation of SN, uh, it will have two special properties. Uh, first, it's gonna be symmetric in the sense that there will be a free Z2 action on this triangulation. Uh, and uh, the second property is that the uh, uh, closed stars of any two uh, opposite vertices are disjoint with each other. Uh, and equivalently, it means that the distance between any two opposite vertices is at least free. And by distance, I mean the edge distance, so how many edges you need to go through to get from the vertex to its opposite. Uh, so in other direction, this is also true. So if you have a triangulation of ascent with these properties, uh, then you can consider its quotient. Its quotient will be uh, RPN, and it will be a triangulation because of the second property. So what we're actually going to do, we're going to look for triangulations of SN with uh, these two properties. Again, symmetric and of large distance between two opposite vertices. Well, not large, at least three. Uh, so here's a very simple example. RPN, uh, RP1, you can take a hexagon, uh, which is symmetric. And uh, you notice that the distance between opposite vertices is three. So between one and minus one, you need to go through three edges. You take the quotient, you get uh, the triangle, which is the minimal triangulation of RP1. And uh, here is an uh, explanation why you do you need a hexagon and not a, why can't you take just a square? Because square has less vertices. Uh, but the issue is that the distance between the opposite vertices is two. So when you quotient, you get uh, something like that, uh, which is, in, in some sense, it is still RP1, but it is not a triangulation. So we need this condition on the distance. And for RP2, uh, instead of a hexagon, you can take uh, an icosahedron. So here you can see it from the top, uh, which is a triangulation of uh, S2. It is symmetric and it's easy to check that the distance between opposite vertices is free. So when you co caution that, you get this which is a very uh, known minimal triangulation of RP2 with six vertices. Okay. And the issue is that uh, there is no way to somehow generalize this to higher dimension. There is no uh, analog of icosahedron in higher dimensions. Um, yeah, so uh, let us start with our construction. Um, First, we start with the cross polytop, uh, which is, uh, well, it's a triangulation of SN, uh, and it is already symmetric. Uh, so, uh, and we number the vertices from one uh, to N with plus and minus signs, which denote the opposite vertices. And now uh, there are two uh, distinct facets uh, in the cross polytop, uh, the positive facet, where all the vertices are positive and the negative facet, where all the vertices are negative. Uh, then uh, what we do, we somehow refine the triangulation of a positive facet uh, using a triangulation T of a simplex. Uh, so I'm not saying what T is uh, yet. And then we just triangulate the negative facet symmetrically so that we preserve the symmetry. Uh, so, uh, now uh, we have an issue that uh, we somehow refine the triangulations of these two facets. Uh, so by adding additional vertices, 
Uh, so what we get is not really a triangulation still because, uh, yet because we have side facets, which are not, not neither positive or negative. And then we need to somehow uh, refine the triangulations as well. So we do that uh, by just noticing that any, every side facet is a join uh, of uh, some simplex sigma from a positive facet and a simplex minus tau from a negative facet. And uh, since you have triangulated sigma and tau, uh, then it's easy to triangulate a join without adding anything, uh, any new vertices. So uh, let me explain this with a picture. Sorry, Sergey. Can you recall what is a cross polytope? Oh, yeah. So a cross polytope is uh, uh, a join of, uh, in this case, n, n line segments. So I guess more correctly to say is to say that we are working at the boundary of a cross polytope. So uh, for n equal three, this is a boundary of octahedron. So yeah or it's a polytope, which is dual to n-dimensional cube. And then we'll look at its boundary. Thank you. Okay. So let me explain uh, this plan in a picture. <coughs> More understandable. So this is our cross polytope. Uh, and it is a symmetric sphere, but you notice that the distance between any two opposite vertices is two. Uh, this is not what we want. So from one to minus one, we can go, let's say, through vertex minus two. So what we do, we somehow uh, refine the triangulation of a positive facet by adding some additional vertices, number four and five in this case. And we add minus four, minus five in the negative facet. So now uh, this is not a triangulation because, for example, we have this uh, quadragon here, one, five, three, minus two. So you need to somehow uh, deal with the side facets. So, but we notice that every side facet, let's say this one, is a join of uh, a simplex uh, from a positive facet and a negative facet. So it is a join of one three, of the edge one three and uh, vertex minus two. Or let's say this facet is a join of the vertex three and the edge minus uh, one minus two. So, uh, and now since that, that joins, uh, and we are we somehow refine the triangulation of things which they are joins joins of. Then we can just do that. In this case, just uh, adding additional edges, and we don't add any new vertices on the side facets. And this is what we get in the end. Uh, so uh, this in this particular example, this triangulation is not good because you can notice that. Uh, from a vertex number five to the vertex minus five, you can still go in only two steps, going through vertex number two. So, uh, which means that uh, what we did is not good enough. So, uh, but we, uh, yeah. So it all depends on how we triangulated the top facet uh, originally. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, by the way, do I need to explain how do you triangulate the join of two simplices if you uh, triangulated the simplices themselves? So since no one complains, I assume that uh, it's clear. So how do we get these blue edges in this picture? Okay. okay it's so, clear for me, I think, but I'm not sure about uh, the audience. Uh, yeah, so I'm asking the audience. Yeah, but as okay. they behave as usually. Uh, I see. So I'll just uh, state it very briefly. So uh, suppose you have synthesis sigma and tau, and you somehow triangulated them. Uh, so then how do you triangulate the joint sigma uh, joint tau? Uh, you do it in the following way. If you have a simplex sigma prime in a triangulation of sigma and tau prime in a triangulation of tau, and you just add uh, the join of this synthesis to the triangulation of the join. So picture would be like that. So you have a join of sigma and tau, sigma is an edge, tau is an edge. Then you somehow triangulate sigma and tau. In this case, you just uh, half both of them. And then uh, you add every possible join. So 
you have a vertex here and the vertex here. So you at the join, which is an edge, you have a half uh, segment here and it's vertex here. So you add the join, which is a triangle and you have a half segment here and half segment here. So you add the join, which is a tetrahedron. So in this way, you don't add any new vertices. So this is what happens. So now uh, the key observation is what do we need from this uh, refinement T of the positive facet so that we uh, actually obtain the, what we want, a uh, triangulation of a sphere with the uh, correct properties. So um, suppose we somehow refine this uh, positive facet of a cross polytope. And uh, suppose we still have this path of length two between uh, vertex X and minus X, which goes through some vertex Y. So X and Y might be new vertices which you add, or they might be old vertex, uh, or old vertices, so maybe X is new and Y is old. So it doesn't really matter. So we can assume that both X and Y lie in the positive facet. Uh, so uh, then the edge XY lies in the positive facet, uh, and the edge Y to the minus X uh, lies in the side facet. And we know that every side facet is a join of uh, a facet of a simplex sigma in the positive facet and simplex minus tau in the negative facet. Uh, so, uh, yeah. So, which means that the edge xy uh, was actually between sigma and tau in the positive facet. So, if uh, our triangulation T of the positive facet has the following property that I need two faces. Uh, which are disjoint, there is no edge between them, then we are fine. So uh, this is the important part, uh, the property of T, which is in red. So we are looking for a triangulation of a simplex such that for any two uh, disjoint uh, sim subsimplices in this simplex, uh, there is no edge which goes between them. So uh, let me give you an example. So in the two-dimensional case, we have a big two-dimensional simplex and uh, disjoint subsimplices are only a vertex and opposite uh, edge. So vertex edge, this vertex, this edge, and this vertex, this edge. So this is some uh, refinement of this triangulation and it is not good enough because there is a very short a sh a path of length one between this vertex and the opposite face uh, or opposite uh, edge. Uh, this, so this edge is the fender here. Uh, on the other hand, we can do something like that. And this would be good because you cannot go from a vertex uh, to the opposite edge or from this vertex to this edge or from this vertex to this edge in only one step. You need at least two steps and this is good enough. So in particular, you can notice that uh, for this triangulation T, you must to, uh, subdivide every edge of your original simplex. Because uh, if there is no point here, then you can go from this vertex to this vertex in one step. And this is bad. Okay. Uh, so yeah. So uh, this is where, what we're going to do next. Uh, so we're going to find the triangulation of a simplex with this property. And uh, we hope that it will have uh, not too many vertices. Okay. Uh, so uh, now let us reinterpret this property uh, in the following way. So we can consider our simplex as the a unit spherical simplex, a uh, line on a unit sphere, and uh, its uh, vertices are at the endpoints of the uh, of the coordinate axis. Uh, then uh, you, then we, might we may measure distance on this sphere in angles. And then uh, if you take any two disjoint uh, subsimplices in your spherical simplex, uh, the distance between them will be exactly 90 degrees. So in this two dimensional case on S2, the distance between an edge and the opposite vertex is 90 degrees. And actually, it doesn't matter uh, to which point on the edge you go, it's all, uh, the length of this uh, arc is always 90 degrees. So in this spherical interpretation, we essentially want to uh, 
triangulate uh, this uh, to triangulate this spherical simplex such that all the edges are shorter than 90 degrees. Because if they're shorter, then uh, you can't go in one step from uh, subsimplex sigma to some uh, disjoint subsimplex tau. Uh, because, yeah, because all of your edges are short. Uh, okay, so this is uh, a more geometric interpretation of what we're gonna do. So how exactly we're gonna do that? So the vertices of our triangulation T will be some of the vertices of the barycentric subdivision of our spherical simplex. And these vertices uh, we identify with the subsets of uh, from one to N. So again, in two dimensional case, we have three vertices one, uh, of the big spherical simplex one, two, and three. And we also have uh, vertices of the barycentric subdivision, which are subsets. 1, 2 is the center of the edge, and 1, 2, 3 is the center of the whole simplex. And also, we're going to think about uh, these points, these vertices of the barycentric subdivision as unit vectors, because they're unit vectors on a sphere, and we assign to them coordinates in the most natural way, uh, like in this picture. So, in particular, I'm going to talk about uh, uh, these vertices of barycentric subdivision as subsets. So I'm going to talk about uh, subset operations on them, but also I'm going to take, talk about their uh, inner product to define the distance between them. And when I'm talking about inner product, I'm imagining them as uh, unit vectors. Okay. So again, and this, um, so how do we construct T? We take some subset V of this uh, vertices of a barycentric subdivision, and then uh, we take the convex hull. So uh, most uh, natural thing. So in this case, uh, if we take the midpoints of the edges and take the convex hull, we get this triangulation. And uh, you can already see that uh, in this case, it is good enough because you cannot go from this vertex to this edge in one step or you must also you might also notice that all the edges of this triangulation are shorter than 90 degrees. So this is what we wanted. Um, okay, so this is our construction. We take some uh, subset V of the uh, points of the barycentric subdivision, and then we take the convex hull. It is it can also be called a Delaunay triangulation on a sphere. So and now. Uh, now it remains to find this subset E, which uh, gives a triangulation of short edges, but which is also not too large. So for example, as V, we can take uh, all the vertices of a barycentric subdivision and all the edges of this triangulation will be short, uh, but uh, it will have too many vertices. So exponentially many, and that's too much. Uh, so, as I said, uh, uh, you need uh, as v. You need uh, in v. You must have all the midpoints uh, of your edges, so for all the two element subsets. Uh, but unfortunately, this is not enough. So uh, this it was good enough here. We only took the uh, midpoints of the edges, but we uh, omitted the point in the center. Uh, but if you go one dimension higher, this is already not working. So if you take a tetrahedron, you take all the midpoints of the edges, uh, you start triangulating this thing, uh, then you have this tetrahedron at the angles, uh, at, the, yeah. Yeah, at the angles, and then in the middle, uh, you will still have this uh, octahedron, uh, which is in blue, and then you need to somehow triangulate it uh, without adding any new vertices. So, um, and then you have an issue because if you want to triangulate an octahedron without adding new vertices, you need to add the diagon uh, one of its diagonals. So let's say you add this uh, red diagonal between this point and this point, but then you will have an edge, a red edge between this edge of your original simplex and this edge of your original simplex. And these edges are disjoint so you get a short path between two disjoint 
uh, faces, which is uh, not what we want. And then no matter how you do it, you get a diagonal uh, of the octahedron and it connects to opposite edges. So uh, in this case, uh, it is not enough to just subdivide the uh, edges of the original simplex. You need to do something more. Okay. So uh, now let me, uh, yeah. Now let us uh, figure out what exactly we need from this set of V of the points of the barycentric subdivision. So since we're taking a convex hull, uh, imagine we have some points A and B in V. So they will be vertices of our convex hull. And suppose the uh, distance between these points is 90 degrees, uh, which means, and the distance on the sphere you can measure using the inner product. So the distance 90 degrees means that uh, the inner product is, is exactly zero. So, and uh, this, and since the uh, distance is 90 degrees, it means that we don't want these points A and B by, uh, to be connected by an edge. So uh, if they're connected by an edge, it means that they lie in some facet of uh, this convex hull. So I've drawn this facet as a horizontal segment here, AB, uh, but uh, it's not just a segment, it's a facet. So in the higher dimensions, you can imagine it as a polytop. So uh, suppose there is a facet like that, which, connect, uh, which contains both A and B, uh, then we can, we can we can consider the normal to this facet, which will be denoted by x. And then uh, suppose there is some point C, which is also in our, in our set V. So it is also a vertex of our convex hull. And suppose this point C is closer to x uh, on the sphere than, uh, than B is and then A is. So this distance xc is smaller than xb and or xa. Well, then we'd get a contradiction because uh, it would mean that this point C lies actually above this facet. Uh, but if it's if A, B is, are on the facet of the convex hull, it means that all the other points of the convex hull lie either on this facet or below it. And if we can find the point C which is above this facet, then this would exactly mean that A and B don't lie in this, uh, there is no facet which contains A and B. So the property we need uh, is like that. We want that for any points A and B in our set V, uh, such that the, in the inner product is zero. And for any point on the sphere X, we want to find a third point C in our set V, such that either this inequality holds or this inequality holds. And also for some uh, reasons, we can assume that the coordinates of X are all non-negative. Uh, I'm not going to go into this detail. Uh, yeah. But, but you said that x is the normal vector to the facet. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And then you said that for any x. Uh, why did you say in this uh, way? Because uh, that's just easier. Okay. We, uh, yeah. Okay. So okay. If, if if the facet is not a line segment, right, then it's not actually a normal to the segment A B. So mm -hmm. we kind of don't know so, much so in the proof, it anyway. So in the proof, you never use uh, that x yeah. uh, lies at the same distance from A and B. Yes, uh, in the proof, I only use that x has non has non-negative. And this comes uh, from the fact that we have uh, all vertices lying in the uh, all vertices um, are positive or something. Uh, yeah, this is not actually enough. Uh, I will. Um, okay. 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 It, it, it comes from the fact that uh, all the facets will, all the facets of this convex hull will lie in the uh, positive, uh, positive quadrant. Uh, uh -huh. Because, yeah, because to be, if, if you want to be completely precise, what we do, uh, we add these points on the sphere, but we also add the opposite points, and then we take the convex hull of this thing and the opposite thing. Uh, so. We get a poly, we get a symmetric polytop, and then uh, uh, it is not uh, 
it is not necessary that all of its, uh, let's say, facets which contain these points lie in the positive quadrant, uh, but it will be guaranteed by some uh, additional property of V, which will be whole, uh, which will hold anyway. So. Okay, I see. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, what the coordinates of x are positive or non-negative, it is important, uh, but otherwise x can be uh, arbitrary. So, again, we need this property for any a and b uh, within the product zero and any point x uh, on the sphere, we want to find the third point c in our set v, such that either this or this holds. Okay, so c is either close uh, yeah, so either this distance is smaller or this distance is smaller. Um, okay. uh, yeah. Uh, now, uh, these are the conditions of V uh, which are sufficient to satisfy uh, this one. Uh, so uh, there are three conditions, two of them simple, one a little bit more involved. So the first condition just means that, uh, so recall that V uh, is actually some set of subsets from one to N, and we want V to contain all the singletons, which just means that uh, V contains all these vertices of our original uh, simplex. Well, obviously it has to, because it's a refinement. Of, uh, we want to refine the triangulation of the simplex. Now the second condition is, um, the closeness uh, undertaken subsets essentially. So if V contains some subset A, then we can remove any uh, singleton from this subset and we should still be in V. So uh, in particular, this property guarantees uh, that if we take a convex hull, then all the interesting facets lie completely in the positive uh, orphan, which means that their uh, normals will also lie in positive orphan. Uh, so, and the third property is exchange property. So, again, for any A and B, such that they're disjoint. So, A disjoint B means exactly that the inner product between the corresponding unit vectors is zero, or that the distance between vertices A and B is 90 degrees. So, for any such two vertices, we want to find some element of A and element of B such that either this holds or this holds. So these two conditions are the same, you just you obtain the second condition by exchanging A with B. Uh, so our proof of uh, the fact that these conditions are satisfying uh, this property will be essentially like that. We take these points A and B and we want to modify them slightly such that we find the third point C where inner product is uh, increased. Uh, yeah. So these are very uh, just purely combinatorial conditions and uh, they're sufficient, or at least this is what I'm gonna prove, uh, but uh, they are not, uh, they're not necessary. So it is possible to maybe find something which will also work and which will give you a smaller set V. So uh, let me first prove that these conditions are sufficient. And uh, after that, I will uh, construct a set V which satisfies these conditions and uh, which is of uh, desired size. So uh, proof of sufficiency. So let's say we have points A and B uh, with the inner product uh, being zero. So we can assume that the coordinates of A are like that. First, uh, it has only, uh, the first small A coordinates are non zero. They're all equal to each, uh, with each other and they will go one over square root of A. Uh, so which means in particular that A is the center of the phase of dimension A minus one, uh, small A minus one. And then uh, for B, uh, we are only interested in one coordinate uh, at the place J, and it will be something, some number, one over square root of B. And then for X, um, we only assume, well, we don't assume anything about X, so we can just say that we can order 
its first A coordinates by in, in the increasing order. And then at the position J, it has some coordinate XJ, and we don't know anything about it, except that all of them are positive, uh, non-negative. Uh, so, and then uh, position J and the position I are special. Those are positions uh, which we have here from this property. So, uh, which those existence are guaranteed by this property. Uh, so, yeah, and I think we assume that this one holds. It doesn't really matter which one, but we assume that this one holds, the first one. So, okay. Uh, this is how our unit vectors look like. And we want to somehow find the third point C uh, such that the inner product of C with X is bigger than the product of X with A or product of X with B. Uh, so first, let us assume that uh, XJ is smaller than XI. So uh, those are two special X's at the special position. So first assume that I1 uh, is greater than the J1. Then we can take point C, which is this one. Uh, so it is obtained from B by adding the uh, i element and removing the j element. And it will be in V by uh, this exchange property. So this is exactly this one. And uh, we can notice that uh, the inner product uh, of C with X will be greater than the inner product of uh, B with X. Why? Because uh, Essentially, in the product of B with X, there will be uh, this summoned XJ times one over square root of B. And with uh, C uh, times X, we'll have this summoned XY times one over square root of B. And since we assume that XY is greater than XJ, then uh, the inner product of X with C will actually be greater than product of X with B. Uh, sorry, so, Sergey. Mm -hmm. For sets, in the product corresponds to intersection or to, uh, to no, so, number? Uh, in the product of two sets is a number because we consider sets as unit vectors. Yeah, it's a number of points in the intersection or in the sum modulo two. What's what's no, the it's a real number? So uh, this is this this is the picture. We consider these points as subsets, right? but they also correspond to unit vectors with uh, irrational coordinates in general, right? And the inner product is the inner product of these uh, unit vectors. Well, so the inner say, product is a cosine of, of a distance, right? Yes. And or, then it, yeah. It's actually, my, it's actually minus the distance up to monotone transformation, right? Uh, yeah. Pi over two minus the distance. Something like that. So the point is that increasing inner product decreasing, uh, decreases yeah. the distance. Yeah. So what's then a set theoretical interpretation of inner product? Uh, on, on transformations. Uh, no, because it depends uh, on the size of the sets as well, somehow. So you can just. Uh, mm. So the inner product of two sets depends on the size of the intersection, but also on the size of the sets themselves. Is it not the number of elements in the sum modulo two? No. Two space? No. no. Mm -hmm. uh, well, because uh, the, the because of those are unit vectors. So when you uh, increase the number of elements in the set, you decrease the corresponding coordinates of the unit vector. Yeah, but still, there should be some simple formula at least up to monotone transformation. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm sure that, it, well, there is a simple formula which involves the sizes of the sets and uh, the size of the intersection. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, yeah, maybe it will be... Um, actually, I'm not sure if it would be better to use such a formula, but uh, it, it is easy to write it, so... Yeah. Uh, so what we uh, proved here is that if we assume that, that xi is greater than xj, then we are fine because then the point C, which is like that, uh, is what we want. It is closer to x and b. Uh, so, uh, which means that now uh, it remains to assume that xj is greater or equal to xi, and we know that xi is greater than x1. So it just 
this coordinate xj is greater than all, well, not all of them, but starting from this one. Uh, so this is the case. And uh, in this case, uh, we consider two points, uh, C1 and C2. So C1 is just A, the set A removed uh, the first coordinate, and C2 is the set A added the J coordinate. And these two, C1 lies in V and C2 lies in V by uh, precisely the properties which we require from V. So, and then uh, as unit vectors, the coordinates of C1 would be uh, like that. Uh, so we will have zero at the, at the first position and one over the square root of A minus one on the positions from the second one up to the eighth one. Uh, so as you see, our the coordinates are changing so, uh, their absolute value as well. So uh, it's a little bit more involved than just uh, intersection of the sets. And then for C2, uh, it will have non-negative uh, positive coordinates at the first A positions and also at the position J. So, and the values of the coordinates will be correspondingly a little bit smaller, one over square root of A plus one. And X is our uh, unknown vector. So now uh, let's just write the inner products. Uh, X with A be just the sum of coordinates of X at these positions divided by square root. X with C1 will be this almost the same and X with C2 will be this one. And uh, this one is greater than this one because we know that XJ, uh, this coordinate of X is actually larger than X1. So we just substitute it by X1. So now we want to prove that either X uh, product C1 greater than X product A or X product C2 greater than X product A. So here I just rewrote these products. And now you can notice that they look almost the same. So let us formalize that. Uh, we can have this function f alpha, which looks like that. And uh, you can also rewrite it like that. And we have that uh, one of the product x with a is f of one, x with c1 is f of zero, and x with c2 is greater than f of two. So this is just uh, simple algebra. So let's say if you put alpha is zero, then you have square root of a minus one here, like this one. And here we have x2 plus and so on, plus x a. So what exactly what we have here. So this is just simple algebra. And now as, as you might have noticed, we have uh, values f0, f1, and f2. And we want to prove that f1 is smaller than either one of either f0 or f2. So what we need is a to prove that the function f is convex. So, and this is exactly what happens. So f alpha is this, uh, let's just use uh, this. Uh, uh, whatever. Um, this form of this function. And now you can see that this is a sum of a linear function. If we consider this as an argument, this square root as an argument plus a hyperbolic function. So, and the hyperbolic function is uh, convex and this function is, uh, well, this one is function is strictly convex and this function is convex. So in general, the sum will be strictly convex, which is what we want. Uh, but there are also some corner cases where uh, this thing can be zero and then we don't actually have a, uh, we don't have a, hyperbolic function here. So we just have a linear function, but if you have a linear function, which is non-constant, then you still have the property that uh, either a previous value is higher or the next value is higher. And uh, there also remains a case where everything is zero, but uh, then we can actually find some single, that, which would mean that the product of X with A is completely zero but then we can find some singleton in our V uh, with which X will give us a positive product, which will still be greater than product with A. So uh, this is the proof of sufficiency. Uh, so essentially what we did, uh, we used this exchange property to slightly increase the uh, inner product uh, using some convexity property. 
So, yeah. Uh, nothing really fancy. Uh, yeah, so if you have any questions, please ask, but uh, I'll just continue assuming that everything is clear. Uh, so, yeah. Now what remains is to construct a, a small set V which satisfies the properties. So let me go back to the properties themselves. So we have these combinatorial properties and um, well, the single toss must be in V. Uh, then this closeness under uh, subsets condition means that V cannot have too large of subsets and V cannot be too large because otherwise we'll have too many subsets themselves. And we also have this property which we want to satisfy. So uh, here's a construction of uh, the set V. So uh, first we partition uh, our set from one to N into several disjoint groups. I'm not saying how exactly now, but uh, it doesn't really matter for now. Uh, so once we've done that, uh, we say that V consists of these subsets from one to N, uh, which intersect every group uh, by only at most max at most one element, uh, except for maybe one group where it can intersect uh, by any number of elements. So this is the uh, essentially the construction of these two lines. Uh, so it is clear that all the singletons are in V because singletons intersect only one group and only by one element, so everything is fine. And then uh, taking subsets is also fine because if you remove something, you don't incre increase the size of the intersection. So, yeah, so these two properties are guaranteed very easily. And it remains to check this exchange property. So, here is a picture and also an example. So let's say our n is 16. So we have 16 uh, elements which are represented by points. And then we partition it uh, into, let's say, four groups of size four each. So we have the first group, the second group, the third group, and the fourth group. And let's say we have an element A in V uh, which has these red dots in it. So uh, First of all, why is it in V? Because A intersects the, third, the first group by three elements. Uh, the second group, it doesn't intersect. The third group, it only has one element. And in the fourth group, it only, it has zero elements again. So everything's fine because uh, A has more than one element only in the first group. So it belongs to V. And uh, let's say also example of B, uh, which is a blue set and it has more than one element in the second group where it has four elements. And in the remaining groups, it only has one element. So um, uh, there are, and what we need to check, we need to check something for two disjoint sets A and B. And for a set A, we say that this group is maximal because in the, this group A contains more than one element. So the first group is maximal for A and the second group is maximal for B. And there are two possible cases. First, uh, we can assume that in the group, which is maximal for A, B has at least one element. So as in this picture, in the first group, which is maximal for A, B has at least one element, exactly one, this one. So, and then we just say that this element, which B has, we call it J, and we pick any element I, uh, which A has in the same group, uh, which is different from J uh, because A and B are disjoint. And we just check that this I, this choice of I and this choice of J satisfies uh, our, uh, our condition. So we need to check that A plus J lies in V. Well, A plus J will have uh, more than one element only in this first group because J lies in the first group uh, which is maximal for A. So we only increase the number of elements A has in the maximal group. And in the maximal group, it, has, it can have any number of elements at once. So everything's fine. 
Now uh, B plus I minus J uh, also has also satisfies everything because uh, in the first group, uh, essentially we just remove J and added I, so we didn't change the number of elements uh, B has in this group. So if it was uh, non-maximal group, so it cannot become uh, more than it was. So we cannot violate our construction of V. Okay, so this is the first case. And the second case is when uh, in the group, which is maximal for A, B has nothing. And then by symmetry, we can also assume that in the group, which is maximal for B, A has nothing. So here we have a second group, which is maximal for A, and B has nothing in this group. And fourth group, which is maximal for B, A has nothing. Then what we do is just uh, pick I from the group, which is maximal for A, and J from the group, which is maximal for B and we check that everything is satisfied. So A plus uh, J uh, lies in V because, well, A has had nothing in this group and then we added J, it only has one element, so it is fine. And B plus I minus J, well, uh, we removed uh, J from here and we added I here, but here B had nothing and we added only one element. So B now has only one element in this group, so everything is still fine. Okay, so this is the second case. So, uh, yeah, now I proved that uh, uh, this construction of groups uh, satisfies, um, uh, satisfies our conditions on B. Uh, so are these conditions of V on V are satisfied by uh, this construction. So now it just remains to count the number of uh, elements we have in V and see that it's not very large. So uh, let us do that. So first we need to choose, uh, to actually choose the groups because I didn't say how we do it, but we do it in the uh, almost obvious way. So we, first we use K groups of roughly the same size, so which would be n over k. And then uh, assume that a lies in v, so how many such a's we can have. First, we need to choose which of the uh, k groups will be maximal for a, so we have k choices. Uh, then once we have a, uh, this maximal group, uh, then uh, a can contain any subset of this max in this maximal group. And there are two to the S subsets roughly. Uh, and then what remains is there remains K minus one group and each of them is of size S. And for each of these groups, we can either pick one element, which is S choices, or we can pick nothing, which is uh, one additional choice. So we have S plus one choices for these uh, K minus one groups. So once we multiply everything, we get this K for the choice of the maximal group, two to the S for the choice of the elements in the maximal group, and S plus one to the K minus one for the choice of elements in the groups which are not maximal. And this gives us this inequality. Uh, so this is a little bit overestimating, but uh, roughly it's what we get. And now uh, we choose S and K. So the choice is uh, pretty natural, which choose them to be roughly square root of n. So if we put square root of n here as s and k, we get essentially this number. Uh, so as Kadi said, it's roughly square root of n to the square root of n. Uh, okay. So uh, this is the construction and the proof of the bond. And uh, yeah. Uh, oops. Oh, okay, so this slide is out of order. Uh, so in the end, uh, let me show you some. So you uh, can ask you, um, can ask you uh, a small question. Yeah. So in itself, this uh, this condition about the vectors, this A B uh, C condition. Is not is not difficult to satisfy if 
you're not using, not necessarily using uh, zero one vectors. Uh, meaning, for example, I don't know, you start with uh, the vectors. Uh, well, you have all the uh, unit, uh, the standard, standard basis vectors, and then you add the vectors of the form. You start with vectors of the form uh, that have uh, one over square root two on two positions, and then you kind of move them slightly towards the interior of this. Uh, uh, so you're saying so, so you're saying essentially you just take the midpoints of the edges of your original simplex, right? Because and and move are, move them slightly inside, for example. Well, if you move them slightly inside, then this is bad because. Uh, so you, you you need this this property about removing coordinates somehow for 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 arguing about. Uh, the fact that x it's enough to consider only uh, positive x or? so uh, 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 if you take so in, instead of taking these points midpoints of the edges right you take them but you move them slightly inside for example yeah and then you take the convex hull then in the convex hull you'll have this very slim triangle here which has this edge and then edge here and then edge here right so something like that go here and then here and then back well, nothing prevents you, of course, from uh, keeping the midpoint as well. Um, you can keep both uh, one, one, and I don't know. Yeah, yeah uh, I see what you mean. Uh, so, yeah, if you keep this, then uh, this is fine. But then I assume that here it will already fail. So, if you. Uh, okay, I mean, it will probably work in this dimension, dimension three. But thing is that in dimension, so. Yeah, yes, I'm just trying to understand uh, like uh, what what else do you use from the zero one kind of uh, thing? Or uh, I mean, wh what is. Yeah, so why, why do we use exactly this the points from the, body, from the body centric subdivision, right? Yeah. Uh, but, uh, but but we also can add uh, the midpoints uh, to the set that Andre described. So we take uh, the shifted uh, midpoints. Yeah, yeah, this is what I said. This is what I said. I see, I see. So, uh, yeah, I think it will work in dimension three, but uh, I would assume it just fail in higher dimensions because, I mean, I guess it might work, and that would be great because that would be just quadratic number of points. Uh, but somehow, I, doubt I mean, that. It, it it sounds fishy, of course. Uh, I just I just want to understand where would your proof fail if we try to use it? Because this claim about the angles would be fine. Uh, this claim? Why? Yeah, because uh, well, uh, <laughs> like what kind of um, so as A and B, you can also take your new points, right? Because uh, you have yeah, this well, no new point. No new point will have scalar product zero with anybody in, uh, that, that are inside. No, no, but it will because if you have higher dimension, so your point has only two non-zero coordinates, right? And then well, let's say if you no, have no, but but then the shifted point uh, has uh, no non-zero coordinates. Uh, sure. Okay. Uh, and it will yeah. supposedly be closer to anything, I mean, especially if you take into account this fact that we only care about the midpoints, kind of, this X is in between A and B. Yeah. Like, intuitively, I would say that it should be closer to X. If, if say, you take two points like uh, 1 over square root 2, 1 over square root 2, and the other one, 0, 0, 1 over square root 2, 1 over square root 2, then this midpoint would be closer to uh, whatever x you would. Uh, yeah, so the thing is that it might not be closer, it might be at the same distance, I think. So you probably can find the next such that uh, here you don't have an equality, you have equality, and equality mm -hmm. is not good enough. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but I'm not sure that it doesn't work, it might work. Okay, because I, I just wonder whether, well, at the previous step, uh, like, 
this kind of uh, claim that you said that uh, it's enough to consider only a non-negative x. Um, does it? How much does it rely on on the structure of your set? Uh, because I mean, would it be enough? It would it be sufficient here to verify this claim? And if it miraculously works, then it works. Or do we need the uh, Oster to do more work about this non-negative x? Uh, no, non-negative x probably be fine because. Uh, so the idea is that if you take uh, these points in the positive quadrant, which you said, and you also take the opposite points in the neg in the negative orphan, and you take the convex hull of all of these things, then you want all of the facets of this convex hull to lie completely in some orphan, so no facet intersecting a uh, boundary between orphans. Mm -hmm. yeah, uh, which is, in this case, it would get guaranteed by this one. But I think in your construction it will also work. So mm -hmm. yeah. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I'm doubtful about what you said, but uh, I I can disprove it. So it might work, okay. and maybe it's worth checking. So, yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, because yeah. It, it, so <laughs> I mean. My main, I mean, it would be uh, very strange if it works. Uh, yeah, yeah. My, my, my main disagreement is that uh, it gives you a quadratic number of vertices, and uh, I very much doubt, doubt that this is uh, possible, but oh, who knows. Okay. So, yeah, I think I'll we'll just check uh, what you said uh, in detail. Uh, yeah. So, uh, this is some numerical data. Uh, so we just, it's a table with the uh, size of the triangulation measured in vertices. So here we have dimensions. And we only know, for RP1, we know that this is a triangle of three vertices. For RP2, we know that this is a icosahedron with six vertices. Uh, for RP3, uh, there are triangulations with 11 vertices, and it is proved that they are optimal. For RP4, there are triangulations with 16 vertices, and it is proved that they, uh, it is optimal, but I think, I don't think, it might not actually be proved. I think it's just checked by a computer that everything smaller is not RP4. And then for RP5, uh, there is a triangulation with 24 vertices, uh, which was found by a computer, uh, but and it is assumed that it is the best one, but uh, yeah, it is not known. So then uh, this result by QNO, uh, which gives it roughly two to the N uh, vertices, well, this precisely number, uh, well, it grows as, expect as expected exponentially. Uh, so here are the numbers for some dimensions. And this previous result by uh, Ventrella and Jenk, uh, which is a very nice uh, Fibonacci-like construction. Uh, you get something like Fibonacci numbers here. Well, essentially it grows uh, as exp exponent with, uh, as an exponent of uh, the golden ratio. So here are some numbers. And this is our construction. Uh, but here I cheat a little bit because I... So uh, when n is small, it doesn't make sense to take the groups, uh, square root of n groups of size square root of n. So I just pick the pick the groups finally so that uh, the result is minimized. So let's say uh, for 25 vertices, I think I pick the groups of size 9, 9, and, and 8. So three groups of roughly the same size. Uh, so and those are exact numbers, you can see that uh, our construction is more or less is worse than the previous one up to dimension 15, uh, where it roughly equals to what uh, the trail engine have. And then uh, it actually is smaller as expected because it doesn't grow exponentially. Well, to be fair, in this sequence, it does grow exponentially, but uh, when L n is getting larger, it grows like square root of n to square root of n. Okay. So, uh, yeah, how much time do I have left? And do I have any time at all? 
25 minutes, I think. Okay, great. 20, so, uh, so uh, yeah, um, I'd like to now first go through all the problems which are open uh, and then maybe prove something else if there is still some time. So just through the whole presentation. Uh, so what is still, well, ev almost everything is still open. Uh, so uh, for example, the case of the torus is very interesting. Uh, so there is this nice construction and actually uh, there are at least three ways to get this uh, construction. And I'm not even sure if they're the same. And there is a conjecture that this is optimal, two to the n plus one, uh, but the best lower bound is just quadratic. So can you improve any of these bounds? That would be interesting. Then uh, the second question is of course about RPN itself, because the lower bound is again quadratic and it's actually the same bound, they prove it in the same way. Uh, and now we have our bound, which is not exponential, but it is not polynomial. And then can you improve that? Or can you improve the lower bound? And for CPN, I'm not even sure. So the lower bound is again quadratic and it's again the same bound. Uh, the upper bound, uh, I would assume that something exponential is easy to prove, but I don't know how. And I'm not sure if it's actually proved. Uh, and the question is, well, again, can you do something better? And I guess it is also interesting for other families of manifolds, like uh, you know, some compact Lie groups, uh, which depend on dimension, how many vertices you need to triangulate them. So no one knows. And so I your think proof it's, doesn't uh, kind of generalize to CPN. Yes, so it doesn't generalize to CPN because uh, you can, of course, there is no no such well, nice correspondence between the sphere, sphere and the Yeah, so there CPM. is the universal cover of CPM and CPM itself. Uh, there is, of course, very nice, um, I think it's called Hope Bundle, where uh, with total space being a sphere, uh, but the issue is that the uh, fiber of this bundle is not uh, as zero, it is as one, so something one dimensional, so, uh, and the group which X will be, uh, will not be discrete. So it's kind of makes everything more complicated. And for the torus, you can also try our approach. So you can uh, look at the universal color of the torus, which would be uh, Rn, just a Euclidean space. And then uh, essentially, you, yeah, you need uh, some, uh, Equivalent cover, uh, equivalent triangulation of Euclidean space, where the distance between the corresponding vertices is at least three. So exactly this, like our conditions, uh, but our approach doesn't work there. So uh, it doesn't allow you to construct something better than that. And uh, yeah, so we are still still working on that. Uh, so uh, this is these are general problems. And then there are also open questions uh, connected to our construction. Uh, so, uh, first of all, in general, how do you triangulate a simplex uh, such that there is no uh, edge connecting to opposite faces? Uh, what's the best way to do it in the terms of number of vertices? So, uh, is there some bound on that? Maybe it's easier to prove the uh, up uh, the lower bound because uh, it's kind of well, just from a logical point of view, it should be easier here to prove the lower bound because the such triangulation of, of the simplex gives you a triangulation of uh, RPN, but it doesn't work in the other way. So it might be easier to prove the lower bound here, but well, we don't know how. And for the upper bound, can you do something better in our construction? So there were, uh, there were already some suggestions. So maybe you can improve that. Uh, and, uh, and then uh, it, there are different ways to try to uh, do it. You can uh, follow uh, the same approach and uh, try to just point, uh, put points on the uh, spherical simplex and take the convex hull. 
Uh, but maybe you don't have the port points in the centers of uh, very centric subdivision. Maybe there is some random construction which uh, gives a nice nice bound. So, uh, or maybe you don't use the serical simplex at all. Maybe you somehow do it more explicitly. Um, yeah. Um, so, yeah, and uh, if you do want to follow this approach, then there is, of course, a question of uh, these conditions, uh, which are sufficient on this set V of points of body centric subdivision, and they're relatively simple. Uh, but they are definitely not uh, necessary. So there is a question, uh, which are necessary conditions on the points of bicentric subdivision, such that the convex hull doesn't have edges of uh, length 90 degrees. And if you can find necessary conditions, then maybe you can find set V, which would be significantly smaller than what we have. So. I personally don't believe in something like uh, even polynomial. Uh, so that's why I'm doubtful about the square uh, and square being an option, but well, who knows? Uh, but uh, still something like n to the log n, or maybe even uh, n to a cubic root of n instead of square root of n uh, would be very nice. So, yeah. Um, yeah, I think no one will be mad at me for uh, ending earlier as opposed to later. So I think I'm going to stop here and just uh, take questions if there are any questions remaining. Can you please show the slide with the lower bound? I'm dying yeah. to see it. You're keeping, keeping it. Yeah. And this one? No, with the lower bound. You had a oh, slide yeah. with. Uh, so this is the. So uh, all the lower bounds are n square here. Yes, but I saw a slide that you were skipping the, with the with the. Oh, idea. The, 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 with the proof or. Yeah. So, uh, I have the proof of the lower bound here in the presentation here. So yeah. Uh, so it's. Yeah, I would also be happy to hear it actually. Okay, it's, it's actually maybe less than 10 minutes. So if no one objects, then I, I can give this proof. So it says that uh, P is just a simplicial complex. It's not a manifold. Uh, and then we just have one co-cycle omega uh, with coefficients in Z2 such that the nth power of omega is non-zero. So this is a very, uh, just very weak homotopical condition on, on P. And then uh, they prove that uh, then P must have quadratic number of vertices. So in particular, it means that RPN and CPN have quadratic number of vertices. Uh, it doesn't work directly for S1 uh, to the N for the torus because, well, it doesn't satisfy this condition, but instead of uh, one cos cycle, it has uh, N different one cos cycles such that their product is non-zero and then uh, the proof also goes through. So this bound actually works for uh, all three examples for complex projective space, for real projective space, and for the torus. So let me just briefly show how it works. Uh, so, so we have this uh, complex P, and suppose uh, we decompose its vertex set into two uh, subsets and uh, X and Y will be sub complexes uh, induced by these vertices, uh, by these vertices. So, and then uh, you have that X, uh, which is sub complex induced by the first half of the vertices is homotopy equivalent to the complement to the Y and vice versa. And on the other hand, P is just the union of these two things. So, let me give you a picture. So this is P, and we decompose the vertex set into two sets, X, which is just a single red point, and Y, which is uh, five um, blue points. And 
Uh, red point induces just itself. Y induces this pentagon. And then you can see that uh, P minus Y will be this one. So we'll just P, we remove the uh, pentagon, which remains at this thing. So this thing is open, so you can contract it to get just a single point X. And uh, here, uh, P minus X is just, we remove this point. So we don't have it, and then we can contract it uh, to this uh, pentagon. Uh, so, yeah, we have this uh, homotopy equivalences. Uh, and now uh, we notice that, well, we have that uh, P has some non-trivial one cos cycle omega such that its nth power is non-zero. So uh, this cos cycle is non-zero, which means that uh, there must be at least uh, one n-dimensional simplex in P uh, where this uh, cos cycle might, might, might take non-zero value. So there is this simplex delta n. And then we take uh, y to be equal to delta n. And then, uh, so uh, y is uh, induced by this n plus one vertices. And then we have uh, what omega on y is zero because uh, y is just a simplex. So it doesn't have any cohomology. So this is true. And this equality holds because P minus X is the same as Y uh, homotopically, uh, as we've seen before. Uh, so now uh, let us assume, now we can we have this form omega, which we can uh, restrict to X where X is uh, just our complex P minus this simplex omega, uh, minus this simplex delta. So assume that omega to n minus one power is zero on X. Uh, then uh, since P is actually the union of this P minus X and P minus Y, we get that omega uh, times omega to n minus one, which is equal to this one, it is zero, which is contradiction. So why is it zero? Because we have that omega is zero on P minus X uh, or on P minus Y. And we assume that omega to the N minus one is zero here. And then just, uh, I think it, you get it from my aviatory sequence in cohomology that if your complex is a union or even if your topological space is a union of two spaces and you have a form which is zero or co-cycle which is zero on one of them and another co-cycle which is zero on another one, uh, then the product of these co-cycles is zero on the whole union. So uh, we get this, pro uh, this product zero, which contradicts the assumption that omega to the n is non-zero. So which means that uh, now omega restricted to x is non-zero to the power n minus one, which means that we can use induction. Uh, so we have this now complex X, uh, which is just P minus this n-dimensional simplex. And on this X, we have a form uh, which is non-zero to the nth minus one power. And then by induction, uh, X has this many vertices and P has just this many vertices plus the vertices of this simplex. So uh, essentially it means with every dimension, the number of vertices grows linearly. So the derivative is linear, which means that the number of vertices is quadratic. So you get exactly this bound. Yeah. Uh, Thank you. Awesome. Yeah, so this is proved by uh, Arnaud and Marin. It's very nice. And uh, yeah, and again, uh, you can see that this uh, bound doesn't use the fact that I uh, have a manifold, uh, that RPM is a manifold. And also, uh, uh, and yeah, so, and you can also ask, uh, can you find a simplicial complex, not a manifold, uh, which has this one cos cycle, and this cos cycle to the nth power is non-zero, and such of this complex. So is this bound sharp for simplicial complexes? Well, this is also not known, so yeah. There are uh, a lot of things which are not known here. Yeah, so uh, I stop again. So any more questions?
I have a comment mm -hmm. uh, for manifolds P. The Arnoux Marine theorem uh, has a simpler reformulation. So let P be a manifold uh, such that there is an echo dimension one sub manifold double, uh, echo dimension one sub manifold omega, whose n fold intersection with, with itself is non zero. Then the same conclusion holds. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's, that's true. And. Um, yeah, that's true, but, uh, okay, let me add the comment that is that you can't prove this, uh, can't do induction in the category of manifolds. So, uh, it is a reformulation, but if you want to do a proof, you have to do it in the category of simply short complexes, because uh, when you remove a simplex and do this uh, contraction, what you get is not necessarily a manifold, manifold anymore. Okay. Well, maybe manifolds with bounder will be sufficient. Mm. Again, probably not because you, when you remove a simplex, some bad things can happen. But I don't know. Okay, so any other questions or comments? Actually, I do have another question. Uh, let's call a family of sets of n element set, uh, let's say an algebra, if it contains singletons, if it is hereditary, and if the third condition we sh showed holds, right? Okay. So what you gave is uh, a construction of small enough algebra on n element set, but do you have an, a lower estimation for the number of elements in algebra? Uh, so, uh, no, but for example, I can say that uh, uh, our construction is not optimal because if we consider uh, subsets of the set from one, of three elements, one, two, and three. Then if you use our construction of groups, no matter how you do it, your algebra will contain every subset, so seven elements. Mm -hmm. uh, but then, um, uh, but then... Uh, Can you show the condition again while uh, we're thinking? Yeah, so... Here are the conditions. Uh, okay, actually, no. So I don't know if you can uh, get the smaller algebra than that, but I assume that you can because uh, then uh, smaller than our construction with uh, partitioning things into groups and then taking elements from groups. So, yeah. Can you conclude from these conditions that uh, there must be a set of size square root n? Uh, because then no. it would give basically, uh, you know, much. Uh, no, I can conclude that there must be, you need to have all two elements, uh, two element subsets. So you have to have all the uh, uh, midpoints of edges. So this follows from this. And um, maybe you can also prove that you have to have all the three element subsets, but. Mm, yeah, you, you can't prove that you have to have uh, some large subset of size square root of n. So maybe you can do something with logarithmic size, uh, size log n. Oh, um, maybe log yeah. square root square yeah. of n. Sorry? So if somebody will construct uh, a sequence of algebras on n, on n element sets of polynomial size, then one would get uh, a polynomial size triangulation of RPM. Yeah. Is it correct? Well, not a sequence, just one algebra. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. So you have a sequence which depends on n. Yes, sure. Yes. So because we prove that these conditions are sufficient for. So it 
a good problem for a high school, school student. I mean, yeah, <laughs> so, but uh, I couldn't solve it. So, uh, okay. I well, you are not a high school student, so <laughs> it's not a problem yeah. for you. Yeah, so, well, okay. Complicated, right? So, the nice thing is that it is uh, very easily formulated. Uh, even though this condition must okay. seem bulky, but um, it's relatively easy. Uh, and yeah, I don't know if you can get the construction which is better than ours. It is possible. And also, as I said, these conditions are not necessary. So you can come up with some different set of conditions, which might be uh, the conditions themselves might be more complicated, but you might be able to actually construct a smaller set V, uh, which satisfies them. And then it's also be great. Okay. Great, yeah. Thanks. So thanks a lot, Sergey. Thank you. It's very intriguing this 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 thing for me at least. So I'll I'll try to think about it, and if I have something, I'll I'll, I'll, I'll write yeah. it. Thank you. Great. So I guess it was the last seminar for for this uh, calendar year, right, Sasha? Yeah, this is the last seminar for, so, for this semester. And I think we will start uh, in February. Great. Okay. Thanks again, Sergey, and uh, yeah, see you next year. Bye-bye. See you. Bye-bye.